Here to discuss the big easy, leadership skills and used car sales, is Tommy Gibbs, president of Tommy Gibbs and Associates. Please give him a warm welcome. I'm Tommy Gibbs. Thanks for taking time to view this video, and I hope you also have taken the time to download the uh, handout, which will really help you during the course of the, uh, the little workshop we're going to do here today. Um, the name of the workshop is The Big Easy. We're in The Big Easy this morning. I realize you're not there, but we're in The Big Easy. And leadership skills and used car sales are pretty easy. Sometimes we make them a little too hard. I'm going to give you some key bullet points that will really help you improve leadership skills and your used car business. Uh, the big easy. Here's the uh, subject matter for today. I've broken it down in five sections. One is defining management. The other one is how does management function. Then what is leadership? We'll get into what is leadership. There's a big difference between being a manager and being a leader. And then we'll talk about what you might want to consider being a champion of. There's certain things in life, and certainly in business, that we need to be a champion of. And then we'll dig into used car sales and show you how to improve your used car business. So the first thing is all about defining management. What is management? Again, management is different than leadership. Management is the control of things. People are things. We're always trying to control things. That's what managers do. People have been taught to be a manager, and so they control things. Management is all about compliance. Uh, it's about getting people to do those things that we've asked them to do. And certainly management is about uh, production and resources. We have to maximize production. We need certain numbers every, every day and every month and every year. It's about maximizing those productions and doing a good job of maximizing our resources. Management ensures that daily tasks are done. That's what managers do. They make sure people do what they're supposed to do. By design in the car business, unfortunately, we pit one department against another. Most dealerships have five different businesses they're running. If you have a body shop, that's five different departments. Sometimes they're fighting with each other and that's what management allows to happen and that's one of the things we need to work on. Management's focus is to follow the rules. We have rules in place. Management makes sure that the people follow the rules. And certainly management thinks in terms of if the team succeeds, the manager succeeds. Managers want their team to succeed because if they do, certainly the, um, the team succeeds, they may succeed. Managers control behavior. It's all about control. Managers are always trying to control how people act, how they perform, how they, how they uh, present things to their customers and that sort of thing. Um, when employees are not trusted, we need even more management. Um, oftentimes, the reason we don't trust employees is we don't give them the tools they need to do their job. We haven't given them the proper training, the proper coaching, so we don't trust them, so we need more managing and more control as exercise. And management oftentimes will allow bullies to exist in the workplace because they're productive. That's a really bad strategy, by the way. And management now has technology that will help them gain even more control. And so management, in terms of management, management is all about having power. Uh, in the car business, oftentimes we have this tower in the showroom. We call it the tower of power. That's the way we work all the deals. Management's all about having more and more power. So how does management function, though? Well, management, in terms of management functioning, what happens with management is they plan. Management's always planning the next, next stage of whatever we're doing. They organize. Managers are all about being organized. And they direct. They're kind of like a conductor in an orchestra. They're, conduct, they're directing everything that's going on in the store. Managers control. It's all about control. We can keep that going to that's a management sort of functions about control. And they evaluate. They're always crunching numbers, always looking at the numbers to see how we can improve our business. But the problem is because they're so in tune with managing, they often panic when business goes south. See, leadership doesn't panic when business goes south because they're used to leading. So let's talk about leadership. Leadership is all about influencing others. It's not so much about having this kind of management control, but it's about influencing others. Management walks the walk. They don't just talk to talk. They don't just tell people how to do something. They lead by example. That's what good management, good leadership does. Leadership puts ethics before production. Far too often, we'll let our ethics slide a little bit because someone is producing. That's not what a leader does. Leadership takes a chance on things that might not work. So leadership is willing to jump out and take a chance. Oftentimes, managers are afraid of change, afraid to take a chance. Leadership follows their true north of their moral compass. That gets back to the whole ethics thing somewhat. And leadership isn't about being the boss. See, leaders are not grooving on being a boss. Uh, le leaders embrace the concept of being a leader. They enjoy being a leader. They enjoy um, getting outside of the box. They enjoy getting the whole team on the same page. Leadership is about championing what's important. What are you a champion of? So let's talk about some things that you might want to consider being a champion of in your organization. 
Leadership is about, about, I'm going to give you eight things, actually, that we're going to be a champion of. And the very first one is really important to me. I'm kind of a nut about this one. It's about being responsive. I didn't say responsible, although they kind of do run together. Leadership is about responding to text messages and emails and, and uh, people leave you a voice message. I'll bet you some of you out here have been on the other end of this deal where you send someone a text message, you send, leave them a voicemail, and you don't get a response back. You should consider being a champion of that. Uh, leadership is about doing what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. How many times have you ever been on the other end of someone saying, I'll call you back by 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock comes, 2 o'clock the next day comes, and they still haven't called you back. You want to try to defeat that concept. And it, leadership is about the eat the frog mentality. I'm a big fan of Mark Twain. Mark Twain has a saying, if you eat a frog every Every morning, nothing you taste the rest of the day is going to taste any worse. So in business, what we should be thinking about is get those things out of the way first thing in the morning that you least want to do. In other words, we all come to work and we have issues we have to deal with. Sometimes we have an employee issue, sometimes we have a customer issue, but the sooner you get that mess out of the way, the better off your day is going to be. And monkey see, monkey do. See, leadership realizes that everybody's watching them. Monkey see, monkey do. Everybody's watching you. I'm important. Don't know what I know. But, it, but the bottom line, bottom line to this is, though, you as a leader have to to set the example. Champion of empathy. Yeah. Uh, can you recognize the emotions of others? That's what leaders do. People have a lot of issues today. You as a leader have to recognize those issues. You have to be picking people up when you recognize that instead of pushing them down. Leaders stay connected and grounded. One of the fundamental basic things I've done all those years I was a new car dealer is I started my morning in the back of the dealership. I'd spend a little one-on-one -on -one time with each technician that I could come in contact with. Same thing with service providers. Same thing with parts folks. Same thing with the office staff. The more you can stay connected to your staff and your team, the better off you'll be. And really, good leadership follows a golden rule. You know, if you think about it, our lives would be so much easier if we all followed that simple principle. If we, if we followed that principle, certainly with our customers and our team members, how much better off would it be? And leadership is also about, it's what leaders do, it'll be a champion of self-evaluation. Look in the mirror and do it frequently. You know, and what can you do better? We can all do things better. Everybody raise your hand. Raise it a little bit higher. See, you raised it higher. See what I mean? We can all do more. We can all do better. Seek feedback from those that will tell you the truth. Everybody won't tell you the truth. You should be talking to people who will tell you the truth about what you can improve on. But no, we want to talk to people who's going to be sort of a yes person, yeah? And we never stop learning. Realize something. We never get this business figured out. If you get one department squared away, something else is going to kind of get messed up. You need to be involved in a 20 group and come to the conventions and that sort of thing. Get outside of your little world. Continue to try to learn. You will never get this business perfectly figured out. Be a champion of discipline. I invented this saying. At least I've said this saying so long I think I invented. The pain of discipline or the pain of regret. You, know, you get to pick which pain you're going to have. This is a great life lesson for your children or your grandchildren. Think about it. In the automobile business or the car business, especially the used car business, I'm going to be talking about here in just a little bit, the pain of discipline is making sure you don't let anything get over 60 days old. That's painful. You have to do a lot of little things every day to make sure that doesn't happen. The pain of regret is you wake up one day, you got a bunch of stuff sitting at the over 60 days old, the market has changed, and now you're really killed in the inventory. In terms of discipline, we must hold ourselves and others accountable. Far too often in this business, we're operating as a nice family, and this is really a good and a positive thing, but because we're sort of a family in our daily activities with this group of people that we work with, we let things slide too much. We have to learn as leaders to hold people accountable. And certainly you need to know and utilize the lead bulls. There's a lead bull in every department. You got a lead bull in the service department, you got a lead bull in the office, you got a lead bull in the sales department. The lead bull are those people that are very, very productive, but they're always stirring the poop up. They're all, no matter what you say or do, they're going to find something wrong with it. You, put, you could put the greatest bonus program in place ever, and I promise you the lead bull will find something wrong with it, but they'll maximize it. They'll figure out how to make all the money, but they're always stirring up. Sometimes you have to meet one-on-one -on -one with the lead bull, maybe take them to lunch, spend a little quality time with them, and try to get them on your side. At some point, if the lead bull isn't going to work with you, you might have to go ahead and say goodbye to the lead bull. And when you do that, there's a hallelujah that will, that will resonate through the dealership because finally the lead bull is gone and not everybody's here. Without discipline, there's ultimately chaos. Think about it. Think of any great sports team that you've ever known of. They're really, really well disciplined. Two teams have recently played in the Super Bowl. I can promise you, besides one of them being sort of a cheetah, but with those, those teams are well disciplined. Trust me on that. Champion of moving the strategy bar. You got to stay ahead of the strategy curve. The you know, strategies are always changing. You don't just put a strategy and it stays there. You must sell those strategies, whatever they are, to your team. 
Far too often, we sort of know the strategies ourselves, but we haven't sold it to the team. They don't really understand it. So the team has to be able to restate those strategies, whatever those strategies might be. And the key here today is, as you look at this, look at this video and other videos from the uh, convention, what strategies can you put to use in your store? You know, you really got to try to find just a few little nuggets you can take back and put in play in your dealership. Be a champion of enthusiasm, yeah. Um, sometimes you have to act it before you can be it. We're not all enthusiastic people. We're not all extroverts. You've heard the old saying, though, you got to fake it till you make it. It sort of applies. There, many years ago, a lot of people went through this deal where if anyone asks you how you're doing today, you say great, and you just keep saying, I'm great, I'm great, I'm great. And the more often you say great, you'll eventually feel great. It's sort of like that. And certainly, when you're enthusiastic, Enthusiastic, you become a magnet for others. People want to be around enthusiastic people. Enthusi being enthusiastic shows your passion for the business. I don't know how you can be in the automobile business and not be passionate about it, but every now and then I'll find a dealership. They do really, really well. There's no passion there from the leadership, but they got a good franchise in the right location, so they do well. Here's something you ought to look for. I do this all the time. You need to look for opportunities to high-five people. High five creates energy, it creates excitement. So look for opportunities during the course of the day to high five folks. It gets people jacked up. I high five waitresses. Recently, I high fived a police officer, and she didn't give me a ticket. I high fived her before she even said anything when she came up to the car. So look for opportunities to high five people. Be a champion of your culture. Culture is so powerful, and you as a leader need to be a champion of your culture. Culture is what separates one group from another. Culture is what makes your dealership different. Culture is so strong for you. Culture is what defeats all enemy strategies, tactics. Culture is just so powerful. You've got, to, you've got to be a champion of your culture and your organization. Culture is what gets you to where you want to go. You've got to have a powerful culture. Culture is communication, though. Culture is your ability as a leader to communicate that culture out there. Culture doesn't work like shake and bake. You may remember that commercial shake and bake on TV. You stick some chicken in some shake and bake, and you throw it in the oven, and it comes out and it's all cooked. Culture doesn't work that way. You can't just come up with a whole bunch of core principles and ideas and put it out there and expect it to stick. Culture is your ability to communicate. Just because you desire something doesn't mean it's going to happen. So your ability as a leader to communicate that culture is what separates you from the others. Culture is a living, breathing thing. You've got to order it every day. It doesn't just happen by happenstance. If you sacrifice your culture, you're selling your soul. You've really got to believe in your culture. There's a fellow by the name of David Hooley. Uh, David is a speaker, he's a futurist, he's, a, uh, he's an author. I heard him speak about a year ago, and David says this about legacy thinking. You want to be a champion of eliminating a legacy thinking, but here's what David said. Legacy thinking is viewing the present and the future through thoughts from the past. Viewing the present and future through thoughts from the past. We get hung up on how we used to do stuff all the time. Here's why legacy thinking oftentimes though, wins. This is why legacy thinking, which we want to eliminate, wins. Legacy thinking wins because we need results now. You know, we need results today, so we're going to rely on how we used to do it, you might say. Legacy thinking is comfortable, and it's what we know. So we, we, we lean on legacy thinking oftentimes because we're very comfy with it. We know how to do it that way. We don't want to change. But the problem with legacy thinking is it ignores changes taking place outside of our organization. See, right now, um, one price selling is becoming a big thing. It's happening outside. We're being forced into it because of the pricing on the Internet. It's happening. Well, we're ignoring it because we don't want to go over there. We're uncomfortable. Legacy thinking is about ignoring that. We'll ignore that. Legacy thinking oftentimes will uh, ignore the fact that um, uh, paying salesmen on gross profit doesn't make a lot of sense anymore. Legacy thinking will ignore um, the, 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 the fact that um, driverless cars are coming down the road. There's a lot of things going on like that, but you end up ignoring it. A legacy thinking reduces that fear of the unknown. So because we're relying on the past, you know, we've always done PACs. We rely on that. We want to ignore the fact that PACs need to go away. Um, legacy thinking uh, thrives on challenging the status quo. So leadership thrives on the fact that they will challenge the status quo. Leaders say, this is difficult. Let's do it. We know it's not going to be easy, but let's get on with it. Leaders don't panic, and they never follow the crowd. They're not following the crowd. They're out in front of the crowd. They're leading. Leaders have this mindset. If it ain't broke, break it and fix it again. That's how they think. Now let's get into used cars. I've got really five key uh, bullet points I'm going to give you with used cars. And the first one is I'm going to give you some market trends. But I have a question for everybody in the audience here in just a second. How many of you have heard the term the race to the bottom? A lot of people know that term today, and they use that term to refer to what's happening to gross profit 
because of what's going on on the internet. Dealers are putting great prices on, out on the internet. They're using software tools like a Viato or someone like that. They're using these tools and they're putting prices out there, but the gross profit keeps coming down because dealers have learned that the cheaper they make their cars, the more likely someone is to show up and it's destroying gross profit. So you'll often hear people say, um, the race to the bottom is going on and our grosses keep going low and lower. Every year grosses are going down, by the way. And I would agree with you that there's no doubt that that's part of the issue, but I believe there's a bigger point that I'd like to make there. What's really going on is you're selling too many cars late in the cycle. How many have struggled to make gross profit on cars that you've had over 60 days old? Of course you do. As a matter of fact, those are the ones that are actually killing your average gross profit. We're selling too many cars late in the cycle. I mean, if you think about it, it's not just the ones over 60, it's the ones at 35 to 30 to 45 days that are killing you. If you would take the time to chart out a graph or a chart, and show the cars you sold in the first 20 days, and 30, and 45, and 60, you would find that the grosses continue to go down. A lot of what we'll talk on this afternoon here, this morning, uh, will uh, evolve around this whole concept of selling cars faster to make more money. Two simple questions for you. Are you maximizing the new car opportunities, excuse me, the used car opportunities in your market? Are you maximizing the used car opportunities in your market? Most of us are not. But how, do we, how does that relate to maximizing new cars? You see, there's a direct relationship between maximizing your used car operation and your new car operation. Oftentimes, people think we can only be good in new, only be good in used. If you're really good in used cars, you're going to sell more new cars. You can step up to more trades. One of the things you have to keep in mind is you have to keep selling lots of new cars in order to have some parts and service business. You got to keep filling that funnel up. You only have about an 18-month window with a new car customer until they start to fade away to the jiffy lubes of the world. So you have to keep filling the new car funnel up. The best way to do that is to be really good in used cars because you can step up and make more deals. Used cars, if you're really good in used cars, you got more used car tickets going through. The average hours per hour on a customer pay ticket that goes through the shop is 1.7. The average hours per hour on a used car ticket that goes through the shop is 4.0. I would suggest to you that you have to really understand that the used car department drives the entire dealership. If you're good in used cars, you're going to sell more new. If you're selling more new, you got more customers coming back. you got more customers coming back, parts and service department is going to make a lot more money. Now, it's a fact that the used car department is the key to doing new and used car retail volume. 60 to 65 percent of every deal you work has a trade-in involved in the process. Therefore, the better you are with used cars, the more deals you're going to make. The problem in the country is we have a lot of dealerships that have a lot of stuff sitting out there over 60 days old. As long as you have a lot of stuff sitting out there over 60 days old in your used car inventory, you're never going to maximize your new car potential, never going to maximize your used car potential. It's killing you. It's choking you to death. The mindset of a typical used car manager, when a trade-in comes to the door and they got a bunch of stuff sitting over 60 days old, their mindset is to try to do what? Try to steal the trade, of course to try to make it for the sins they already have. So until you fix that, you'll never be but so good. You'll have some good used car months. I mean, you'll, it'll be springtime of the year. You have a pretty good month. But you won't be consistently good till you get that problem out of the way. Most used car managers, by the way, are trained by other used car managers and local wholesalers. That's how they get their training. And so consequently, they don't really understand that aspect of the business. But with such training, with used car managers not getting a lot of training and kind of flying by the seat of the pants and listening to what the wholesalers say, then we're asking them, though, to manage millions of dollars of inventory. I want to share some numbers with you quickly from last year. Last year, many people have already heard about the 17.5 million new cars that we sold. That's a number most people have heard about by now. Most people haven't heard about how many used cars we sold. We sold 40.6 million used cars last year. Look how much bigger the used car market is than the new car market. I'm going to break it down for you, though. Franchise dealers only got 15, 15 million of that number. 13.9 million by independent dealers, and certainly private individuals, 11.7. The one I want to focus on, though, is the independent dealers. The independent dealers sold 13.9 used cars last year. 13.9 million. 13.9 million. Say it right, boy. Um, where did most of those used car dealers get their inventory? Yeah, that's right. They got them from you. They either got them directly from you or from auction. So I will oftentimes ask a manager, why do you keep letting them have your inventory? And they'll say, well, because some of it's junk. I'll give, you, I'll give you that. Some of it you trade in, you don't want to mess with it, it is junk. But more often than not, it's because we become prejudiced against certain types of cars we don't want to sell. Pretend you're a Ford dealer, and the number one selling used car in your market is a Honda Accord. You trade in a really nice Honda Accord. 60 days later, you still got that really nice Honda Accord at your Ford store. You take it to the auction, lose $2,000 on it. What's your attitude the next time you trade in a nice Honda Accord? Not so good. You're probably not going to make the deal. Look, 
If you couldn't sell that really nice Honda Accord, that's on you. You didn't price it right. You didn't market it right. You didn't picture it right. You didn't do something right if you can't sell the number one used car in the market. But the other prejudice that we have that oftentimes happens is we trade cars in. We got five, six, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars in these cars. Every time we send them to the shop, the shop is killing us. They're ripping our eyes right out of our heads. They're laying us away back there. We finally conclude that we can't make any money on these cars because the shop is charging us too money, much money on these cars. So we let we let those cars get off and get, get gone to the wholesalers of the world. But wait a minute, we still need inventory. So what do we do? We go to the auction and buy what? Late, late model used cars. One, two-year-old cars. You don't have to spend a lot of money on them. But now you've really shot yourself in the foot because what's going to happen now is the average cost per used car in stock has now crept up and up and up and gotten very close to your new car pricing, when the factory comes out with rebates, incentives, and interest rates, and all the weird things the factory comes out with sometimes, you get your head handed to you on a platter because the cost of your inventory has gotten too close to your new car business. So let's talk about if you had a million dollars, and I'm sure a lot of you do. Um, most people know what a mutual fund is. You're in a mutual fund because you're trying to hedge your bet. You've got some winners in that mutual fund, some losers in your mutual fund. You hope at the end of the day you make some money. I, sometimes I think subconsciously, subconsciously, that's the way new car dealers think about their used car inventory. They know they got some winners out there, they got some losers out there, and they hope at the end of the day they make some money. I would suggest to you, your thinking should be that you are a day trader, and every used car sitting out there is nothing but a short-term stock, and your job as a day trader is to maximize the return on investment of each of those cars. I'm going to walk you through the return on investment and how it works. You don't need to know the math, but you do need to understand the numbers that go into it. The first number that goes into it is how much gross profit did you make. And this example I have on the screen here, we made $2,500. Now, you need to also jot this down if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, because when you take notes, you tend to remember things better, even if you can't read your writing like myself. Well, write this down, 110 to 120%, 110 to 120. That, that's the sweet spot. That's the ROI you're trying to get to on every deal. Now, um, if you wanted to use F&I in the equation, you'd have to double the sweet spot. I just stated to you that the first piece of the equation is how much gross profit did you make on the front. If you want to put F&I in, it's got to be over 200%. So the next number that goes into the equation is how much money did you have in the car. In this example, we had $12,000 in the car, and this car only set for 25 days. When you run the numbers, those are the three numbers. Gross profit, how much you have in the car, number of days. When you run the numbers, we made a 303% return on investment. How many of you would like to have a 303% return on investment on a stock you own in the stock market? That's strong, it's goat's breath, right? Look at the three numbers, though, and see if you can tell me why you think it was so good. Well, of course, it was $2,500 as a decent gross profit. You only had $12,000 in the car. It only set for 25 days. Everything lined up perfectly. Look at my next example. You make 25, you got $12,000 in the car, but the car is set for 60 days. But the ROI still hit the sweet spot. It's 131%. That's, uh, excuse me, 141%. That's absolutely perfect. We'll take it all day long. Why was it so good on that car? You got that right. It, it, we, we, you made 2,500. You only had 12,000 in it would probably hurt it just a little bit. You should see this pretty easily. The 60 days hurt it just a little bit. I have a question for you. How often do you think you're going to keep a car for 60 days and make 2,500 on it? How often do you think it's going to happen? Not too often. I was doing a 20 group meeting a number of years ago, and they always set the room up in a horseshoe, sitting on the right-hand side in the second seat. The dealer says to me, he says, Tommy, the problem with the car business is every now and then a miracle happens. See, that's the miracle right there. That is a miracle. We're always looking for the miracle. We had this one car back 10 years ago. We held the car for 85 days. We made five grand on it. That brain's going, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. You really can't. That's a really bad business model. Look at my next example. You got to make $2,500. We got $27,500 in the car. 25 days, this car sets the ROI is 131%. Why was it so good on that car? Yeah, that's no doubt. We made 2,500, only set for 25 days. Return on investment's very sweet, 131. Would it obviously hurt it a little bit? Yeah, the 27.5, you got a lot of money tied up in it. You know, it's really weird about the car business is you would think the more money you have in something, the more money you'd make. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. I mean, if you were in the real estate business, you sold $3 million houses, you'd make more on those than a $300,000 house. There's a moral to the story that you need to think seriously about, and this is something you need to carry back to your team and put it in play and have a clear understanding. If you have a lot of money tied up in a car, what has to happen? Yes, you've got to turn the car really, really fast. Look at my last example. We made the 25, you got 27.5 tied up in the car, and uh, the car's set for 60 days. Now, you should be very happy if you can make 25 at 60, but look what happened to their ROI in this particular deal. It went down to 61.20%. That's not making any money. 
So you got to understand, if you've got a lot of money in your car, you got to do what? Turn the inventory really fast. Oh, I, I'm really, I, I do my own PowerPoint slides, and I'm really, really smart like that. I know how to do PowerPoint, right? And uh, of all the slides I've ever made up in my life, the one I'm going to show you now is the one I'm the most proud of. You probably have never said this, but you've heard someone say this. And it goes like this. Famous last words. I don't want to get rid of it because I can't replace it. You probably heard somebody say that. I bet you didn't say it, but you've heard somebody say it. People will say to them, going, what did you just say? And they go, well, I don't want to get rid of that car because I can't replace it. Now, they've had the car for 85 days, and they don't want to get rid of it because they can't replace it. Well, what did you just say? Say it again. I don't want to get rid of it because I can't replace it. You tell me you want some more of that. In other words, there's a reason this car is still sitting here. It's a bad color, got bad equipment, got bad miles, it's stinky. There, there's, some, there's a reason it is still with it, and you're telling me you want some more of that. It's one of those whole insanity things. It doesn't make a bit of sense. Now, let me, I'm going to show you some more numbers here. I'm going to do a little bit different than the first slide I, the slide I just showed you. We got a car, you got 15,000, so I'm going to work it backwards. We hit the sweet spot. Sweet spot's 100, uh, 117%. Take that all day long. Car set for 25 days. We only made $1,200. I'm not suggesting you should only make $1,200, but on this deal, we hit the sweet spot by making 12 in 25 days. Next example. We hit the sweet spot at 118%. We held the car 60 days. Well, we had, we all, we had to make 2,900 at 60 to hit the sweet spot. The odds are not good, and you know it, okay? Now, on the same car, if it, at the end of 60, you get a chance to make 12, and you should be very happy if you can make 12 at 60. You should be absolutely thrilled. But look what happened to the ROI. It went at 49%. Now, if you're one of those folks that are watching this video that have convinced yourself or let someone convince you it's okay to keep a car for 90 days, which in Tommy's world it isn't, but if you've convinced yourself, at 90 days, if you get lucky enough to make 12, you ought to be happy. No question about it. But look what happened to the ROI. It really went in the tank at 32%. And if you're going to hit the sweet spot at 90 days, you got to make $4,300 on a $15,000 car. What do you think the odds are? They ain't good, that's for sure. Um, there's a website you can go to called fixroi.com. You should be tracking ROI. And there's a spreadsheet. If you want the spreadsheet, send me an email. I'll send you a spreadsheet. It costs you nothing. Or you can go to fixroi.com, and you just plug in the three numbers we just talked about. And it's, if you made $1,500 on the car, you plug that in. Um, $12,000 is what you had in the car. And let's say the car said 57 days. You just put the three numbers in. When you push the little button that, where it says calculate ROI, when you push the button on the right-hand side down there, it'll pop up. And you see that little uh, frowning face on the right-hand side? When we actually, when this actually does it on the internet, the baby, it's a baby crying. It's going, wah, wah, wah. it's really, really bad. And, and because it's only 80%. But on the next example, made 15, got 12,000 in the car, it's set for 18 days. What happens then is the crowd claps, you get a smiley face. Yeah, you can hear it, right? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Now you're probably sitting there thinking, this is really silly. See, I don't think it's silly because I thought this up and I really do like it. But let me tell you what's really silly. What's really silly is so many dealers are not tracking us. They have no concept of ROI. I would encourage you, urge you to start tracking it. Here's a spreadsheet. I have, get about 300 of these from my dealers each month. And here's one that came into me recently. And um, I took the names of the customers off and the name of the salespeople off. And I sorted this dealer's spreadsheet by days in stock. So pay close attention on the, on the spreadsheet. Dealer has a car for four days, and if you look to the right, he made 699%. Another four-day car, he made 1,055. Five days, 589. You see all those different days and the amount of money he made on those short-term cars? He had this one goofy deal that you can see there at 19 days that didn't do well. But look at all those, 112, 115, 310. I hope you can see those. Somewhere around 30, 35 days, it goes in the tank. Look at the ROIs and the rest of his deals here. Look. He had a car for 44 days, minus 10, 50 days, 3.5, I'm jumping around, 59 days, minus 32. There's no money really being made after 30 days. That's what you got to come to grips with. I'm not suggesting you should be dumping your inventory at 30. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply suggesting you need to be conscious. I want to urge you to start tracking something called 3030. Again, it's a spreadsheet you're welcome to have. It's really simple to use. On the left-hand side of the spreadsheet, you will put all those cars as you deliver them and the gross profit that's under 30 days old. So you deliver a car, it's 25 days old, it goes in the left-hand column. On the right-hand column, you put all those cars that you sell after 30 days old. So look at these examples, a few examples I pulled from dealers who have sent me. $1,424 is what the dealer is making on every car he or she is selling under 30 days old. 
Over 30 days old, look at it, it's, three, it's uh, $542. Can you see a big difference? $27.29, $484. Remember, the longer you keep a car, the worse gross, gross profit is. Dealers are complaining about the averages coming down, and they want to blame it on the internet. They want to blame it on auto trader. They want to blame it on Viato. No, 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 no. The real problem is selling too many cars late in the cycle. Look at this next example. $13.13 on the front, $75 if it's over 30. Under 30, 13, 13, over 30. Here's another one, 1407, 1110. So just keep it in the forefront of your mind. You've got to turn the inventory fast if you're going to make money. Here's, a, here's an easy way for you to think about it. You always need to be thinking about pressing your costs down. If you were to go and run some numbers and lay all your spreadsheets out and look at the average cost per unit you sold for each month through the calendar year, you would find, you would find the month in which you sold the most used cars is the month in which your average cost per unit in stock was the absolute lowest. Let me say it again. If you were to lay this out on a spreadsheet and check the numbers, you'd find the month in which you sold the most used cars is the month in which your average cost per unit sold was the lowest for the entire year. You'd also find the month in which you had your worst unit sales volume is the month in which your average cost per unit sold was the highest for the entire year. The principle I'm going to give you applies regardless of your set of circumstances. There's no set of, set of circumstances you could, that you could share with me that will negate what I'm about to share with you. If you, if you lived in Texas and you do a great job with high dollar picking up trucks and SUVs, that would be irrelevant to the principle. If you're in the D.C. market, as an example, maybe you have a lot of afflu affluent people up there, have a lot of money, well, absolutely, you might have to stock a little higher cars, but that is irrelevant to the to, to with the principle I'm going to give you. If you own the buy here, pay here lot, that too is irrelevant. The principle is really simple. Here it is. You need to know every day of your life what is your average cost per used car in stock. You got to look at it this morning, see what it is. You've got software that will tell you. And whatever the number is, you need to be thinking about what could you do to press it down. If you look at it this morning, your average cost per used car in stock is 19000 Your brain should be going, what can I do to get 18.5? 18.5 to 18, 18 to 17.5. The more you press your average cost per used car in stock down, the more you end up getting in the used car business and out of the news car business. News cars is a word I made up. I make up lots of words. News cars is when the average cost per used car in stock keeps creeping up and up and up, gets very close to your new car pricing. In fact, it comes out with rebates, incentives, and interest rates. You get your head handed to you in a platter. There's no special number you're trying to get to. You just want to be better than you were yesterday. Now, you may be thinking, well, Tommy's trying to tell me to go to the auction and buy cheaper cars, and that's really hard to do. That's not what I'm saying. It's not so much about what you buy at the auction sometimes, but what you don't buy and about what you keep versus what you wholesale. You should be trying to retail every vehicle that has a breath of life left in it. So every day I would suggest that you do the following. Uh, on, the, on the page here, you'll notice that... Uh, um, we've sorted this deal as inventory, 0 to 30, 31 to 60, 61 to 90, 91 to 120, 120 days and up. If you look on the right-hand side of that page that you're looking at now, um, you'll notice that the deal's average cost for each of those categories, 0 to 30 is 93, 31 to 60 days old, his average cost is 14, 61 to 90 is 17, 91 to 120 is $20,000, 120 days up is 24. There's a connection between the left column and the right column. And that is, the longer the cars stay in stock, the more expensive they are. The more expensive cars are not turning. So you need to be well aware of that. Now, look at the number here, 16070. That's that dealer's average cost per used car in stock this morning. I require my used car manager to print this page out, circle it every day, put the initials in it, put it on my desk. The more I can force feed my used car manager to pay attention to that, the better off I'd be. If you were my used car manager, I was your general manager or dealer operator, I would drive you nuts about this. Every time I'd see you in the hallway, I'd say, what is it, what is it, what is it? I'd make you tell me 10 times a day, what is our average cost? I know the more I can get you to think about it, the better off we're gonna be. Let's talk about attacking some cars. It's time to attack. We're gonna do this every day. There's only one definition for the word every. So we're going to do this every day. Every day we're going to sort our inventory by cost or investment with the most expensive car at the top. So we're going to go to our, go to our inventory system, whatever we're using, and we're going to have the most expensive car at the top. I'll put this on a spreadsheet so you can see a little more easily. If you, we're going to attack the 10 most expensive. If you have a small inventory, you can attack just the five most expensive. But what we're going to do is print it out, sort it this way, and we're going to attack those 10 cars. What do I mean by attack those 10 cars? First and foremost, we're going to make a copy of this every morning and give a copy to the service director. The service director and I are going to have a very clear understanding that if any of these 10 cars happens to be in the service department, he or she has got to get them out in a hurry. Why do they have to get them out in a hurry? Yeah, because they're one of our 10 most expensive, which are going to be the most difficult for us to sell. So I've got to get everybody on the same page of understanding, get these cars through the system. Number next, I'm going to make sure all the managers have a copy of this. 
every member of the management team will have a copy of this so that they understand if you get a chance to work a deal on one of these cars, they need to go away. Third and really important, third thing is, I want to make sure I price these cars really tight to the market. I'm not worried about making a lot of money on these cars, unless there's something special about one of them. Fundamentally, I'm going to price these cars really, really tight to the market. Some of them might even be below invoice, below what I have in them, rather. I've got to make these cars go away in a hurry. The one exception is if you have a car and you're 10 most expensive cars, and you know you always do really well with it, you wouldn't want to serve it up at a bargain basement price. But again, remember, I've got to get these cars to go away. I'm not going to price these cars like I normally price my inventory. Fourth and final thing I'm going to do is I'm going to consider putting bonus money on these 10 cars regardless of the number of days they've been in stock. Even if I've only had one of these cars six days, I might want to put bonus money on it. We do it kind of backwards in the business. Think about it. If we've got a car in inventory, oftentimes in our business model is we'll sell a car for what we have in it or less when it's around 60 days old. And we pay the salesman $500 on it to make it go away. Dealers, dealer principals are really smart people. The dealer is looking at the financial statement every month and looking at something called salesman's compensation as a percentage of gross profit. The percentage that they're trying to get to after they shake out packs and all the weird things we do sometimes is 17 to 20%. Pretty soon, though, because the dealer is selling cars around 60 days for what they have in it or less and paying the salesman a $500 bonus on them to make them go away, pretty soon that percentage creeps up. Pretty soon it's at 22, it's at 27, 28. I've seen some as high as 32. Finally, the dealers looked at this for several months, and the percentage keeps creeping up, and the salesman's pay plan in the dealer's mind is out of line. When a salesman's pay plan gets out of line, what does a really smart dealer do? They change the salesman's pay plan, which is always a really happy and exciting event in the dealership. Everybody gets really excited. Not that it's supposed to be funny, but it's probably not to you, but it is to me. But the bottom line is, there's probably nothing wrong with the pay plan. What's wrong is how you manage the inventory. You'd be better off to serve these cars up at a really good price point to get them out of here and pay a bonus on them sooner rather than later. We pay salesmen a bonus to lose money. It's kind of crazy if you think about it, yeah. So it's a short life. This is my life cycle management process here. And um, this will really change your business model. It'll really help you more than you can imagine. You know, we acquire cars. We either purchase cars or we trade cars. That's acquisition. And we're going to do something called a trade walk every day. But even before that, we want to make sure we replace that these cars are staged. When they come in from off the truck, if we bought cars, or if we traded cars in, there's a place where they're all parked. And then every morning, all the members of the management team, new car, F and I, who, whatever manager's on duty that morning, we're all going to go do a trade walk. And the service manager's going to be with us. And we're going to look at those cars as a group, and we're going to decide what to do with them. The first decision we're going to make as a group is whether we're going to wholesale or retail them. We're going to make that decision. I never want one person making this decision. As smart as I might think I am about used cars, if you were to hire me today, I wouldn't want to make this decision alone. The more people you can get involved, the more opportunities you're going to find. And then during the course of the trade walk, we're going to assign each of these people, each, each of these vehicles, we're going to assign each of these vehicles an expiration date. They all don't get the same number of days. If you're on a 60-day program, they don't all get 60 days. Some are going to get, some are going to get 20, some are going to get 30, some are going to get 45, some may get 60. They all don't deserve 60 days. How many of you have ever seen the movie? Uh, Wayne's World. You remember that part in Wayne's World where they're screaming, we're not worthy, we're not worthy. All cars are not worthy of 60 days. We're always thinking about how can we retail them. So we're going to give them a timeline and try to, with a great sense of urgency to find a retail buyer for these cars at some number. We're going to turn and burn them. These cars are going to be turning. Look to book. Most of us know what look to book is, but let me make sure that we're all on the same page. How many cars did we appraise this month? How many did we look at? How many did we get? If we praised 100 and got 25, I looked to book as 25%. The more you can raise your look to book, the better off you're going to be. The more you can raise your look to book, the less of a need you have to go to the auction and buy cars. It's really difficult for you to make money on those auction cars. Did you ever notice that when you go to the auction and buy cars, the market's always up? And when you go to sell cars, the market's always down? Did you ever notice that? They see you coming. For you, it's on the same day. On the same day, they'd be up for you if you're trying to buy and low if you're trying to sell. So the more you can raise your look to book, the better off you are going to be. These are some life cycle factors. These are things that impact how long a car is ultimately going to stay with you. Now remember, i got to keep hammering this. Remember, the longer the car stays with you, the less what happens, the less gross that you make, yes? So if you acquire a car and it sits around for two or three days, before it ever gets in the shop, if you have parts and service issues, you're backed up, you're not willing to reroute them, you don't want to send them out for somebody else to work on, I understand the reasons. Uh, if you, your photos, the quality and the quantity of your photos, you need to take a look at some really good websites like eCar1, Texas Direct, Carvana. Look at some of their websites and compare their photos to yours. If you don't have a photo booth, you're really missing it. 
I don't know how, how you can be competitive in today's market. Everybody that buys a used car shops the internet. You gotta be looking really good on the internet. Taking car photos outside isn't gonna work well. You got shadows, you got raindrops, it's just a mess. You need to find some place in your store that you can set up a photo booth or go up the street and rent some more property maybe. They don't get posted on the internet in a timely manner. Uh, you got pricing strategies that really aren't working for you that causes cars to set gross profit averages. You've got this hang up about what they need to be and lack of accountability. And if any of that's going on, here's what's going to happen. You're going to get a slow turn. Inventory's going to turn slow if you don't get it through the shop. Um, not only is it going to turn slow, it's going to start to age on you because it is turning slow, no doubt. Your volume's going to get impacted. If you can't get stuff through the shop, you can't do any volume. Gross profit's going to be impacted. You're going to put a poor return on investment, no doubt. And attitudes go in the crop. I don't know if y'all realize this or not, but people who work in the sales department are very emotional people. They get their panties in a bunch in a hurry. And if, you know, if they keep hitting a brick wall and they keep getting all sideways, they really can't sell. It's a difficult environment. Your ability to trade the door is impacted. Now, we're going to use something called early warning radar. It's a little decal that looks just like this that's on your screen. It's about six inches by six inches. Uh, you can take us and duplicate it. And each day, each day what we're going to do is, as we identify certain cars during the course of the trade walk, we're going to identify certain cars that are only going to get 20 days worth of a life cycle. So in 20 days, we have to find a retail buyer at some price. We're going to take a marker and mark in that little block right there the day it has to be gone by. And we're going to put those decals on the side of the window, on the windshield. I don't really care where you put it. Put it on the car. Here are some cars that you might want to only hold 20 days. Now remember, the faster these cars go away, the more money you're making. It's a car you overpraise. Oftentimes, we put too much money in a car, and our brain goes, oh, we'll retail out of it. No big deal. No, 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 no. We need a plan for it. This is where you got to be blatantly honest about what you did yourselves last night. We're all standing here this morning looking at the car. We traded it last night. We put too much money in it. We're going to admit we got too much money in it. Price it right, get it out of here. It's a make-a-deal car. You ever have a car in your new car inventory and nobody's opened the door in 300 days? Nobody ever, nobody's even looked at it. Guy came in last night. This is a trade-in. He wanted that car. You really bury yourself in the car on this one. You're killing yourself in this car to make that one go away. 20 days and gone. Price it right, get it out of here. I want to emphasize again. Retailing these cars really fast improves your average gross profit because these are the same cars that you're selling at 60 days, killing yourself. It's got odd equipment. I would think you know what odd equipment. Some, some, cars need, some cars need a sunroof. Some cars need leather. Some cars need a GPS, yeah? Sometimes a car you buy at the auction has got odd equipment on it. You say, huh? Yeah, watch. Some of you stand there bidding on a car. They drop the hammer, but that's not the car you bought. The car you bought is already out the door, but this is the one you thought you bought. If that's never happened to you, you just haven't bought enough enough used cars at the auctions. But you come back to the dealership and go, oh, the market was really up. No, no, no. You got to admit you made a mistake. You say, look, guys, this car right here, I messed up yesterday. Price it right. Get it out of here. It's a bad model for your store. I bet you everybody that's watching this video right now knows that certain cars, when they come in your inventory, they're very difficult for you to sell. You know what they are. Price them right. Get them out of here. It's a bad color. We all know that some colors are good. Some colors are bad, depending on the model. I was a Volvo dealer. I was not a very good Volvo dealer. Volvo of America hated me. I hated Volvo of America. The Volvo customers hated me. I hated them. I never understood those people because Volvo one year came up with a bright red Volvo. It was a beautiful car. The Volvo customer actually hated bright red, but they loved that puke tan. Does anybody remember that puke tan Volvo? They loved that yucky tan car, yeah? But you've got to know what colors are hot and what's not. If it's a bad color, it's a bad color on day one, not day 61. Price it right, get it out of here in 20 days. Got no experience with you trading a Mercedes convertible last night. Never had one of those before. You get all excited about it. Look, price it right. Capture a customer you would not normally get. Don't worry so much about making a home run on it. Get it out of here. Customer trade out. You ever have a customer that hates living? They hate life. They hate their car. They've only had their new car six months, and they're miserable. They've complained to everybody in the dealership. I mean, they've complained to the porter. They've complained to the cashier. They complained to the general manager, general sales manager. Finally, the dealer, the owner, gets wind of this, and the dealer comes out and says, hey, look, this guy's a neighbor of mine. He's bought three cars from us. Just Y'all need to trade him out of this car and make him happy. Now, the dealer, whenever the dealer gets involved in helping you appraise a car like that, do you understand how killed you are in the car? 
So you can't mess around with this car. The dealer screwed it up. Price a car right. Get it out of here. Don't be worried about making money on it because you ain't going to make any money on it. It's got a potentially larger pair bill. Sometimes the RO is going to bury you in a car. Price it right and get it out of here. It's a high dollar vehicle. It's not uncommon today to trade in a vehicle you got 40 plus thousand dollars in it. Yeah. So price that car right because it's going to be problematic because there's fewer people that can buy that car. It's got high miles. You know what high miles are. If it's, if it's a high miles car and it's not working for you, price it right, get it out of here. It's a Carfax report, it's a little bit suspicious, not bad, not bad, but a little bit iffy. I like my last bullet point the most. It says horse versus zebra, bad gut feeling. You ever have a bad gut feeling about a car? Y'all all standing this morning looking at the car and you go, you know, something about this car bothers me. I'm not sure what it is. Sometimes it's just a little stinky, something weird about it. Look, think about it this way. When you've seen thousands of horses in your career, and all of a sudden a zebra runs in the middle of the herd. Can't you spot a zebra once in a while? Of course you can. Now, I'm going to prove to you this works. You're going to have to do this on your own, but I'm going to prove this to you this works. I want you to go look at your used car inventory. And I want you to look at your oldest cars in stock. And ask yourself some of these questions. How long have you had it? Was it a purchase or a trade-in? Was it high, is it high miles? Is it a bad color? Ask those kind of questions. I can guarantee you that your oldest used cars in stock have a storyline tied to them. And the storyline that's tied to them was there on day one, not day 61. Cars do not age on day 61. They age on day one because we don't pay attention. It's almost like you trade these cars in, and they're smacking you upside the head, and they're going, I'm going to be a problem. I'm going to be a problem. And you just ignore them. You go, nah, we got this. No, no, no. What you need to be gotten is a strategy to make them go away. The sooner you get on top of these cars, the better you're going to be. I have a dealer, uh, and this dealer owns a Toyota Chevy store, and he traded in a, a, Dodge, excuse me, a Ford pickup truck. And I was having this conversation with him. The truck was 185 days old. And I asked him, I said, well, why do you sell this truck? He said, because it's a Ford diesel. I said, what? He says, it's a 6.0 Ford, 6.0 liter. It had it 185 days. If you know anything about Ford, you know that's not a good truck. It's not a good engine. And so I said to the dealer, let me ask you something. He said, what? I said, when you trade this truck in, did it have a gas engine in it? And you took the gas engine out and put the diesel in? Well, he got my humor. Maybe you're not, but he got my humor. But the point is, it is what it is on what day? Day one. Here's some suggested expiration dates for you. Early warning radar cars are the ones I just gave you, 20 days and gone. These are the most problematic. Price them right get them out of here. If they're not gone in 20, you've got to take them to the auction and dump them. That's the rule. But you've got, you got to get on top of them in a hurry and price them right. I give auction purchase cars 30 days. That's all they get. You can go back and replace them unless there's something really special about those cars. I'm not messing around with those cars. I'm going to turn and burn them and go back and get some more. And I give trade-ins and cars I buy from my customer, my owner base. I'm going to give those the longest life cycle because they're my nicest cars. So trade-ins are going to get 45 days. You could do it any way you want to. If you don't like my method, you could say, you know what, I'm going to give some cars 30, some cars 60. I'm begging you, I'm begging you right now, stop giving them all the same number of days. They don't deserve it. They're killing you. They're destroying your average gross profit because you're selling too many of those bad cars late in the cycle. But if you were on a 60-day turn, it's really not about how many days the older car happens to be anymore. It's about how many days are actually left in the life cycle. You're going to be assigning them different life cycle days. So if a car is actually 45 days old this morning, it's not really 45 days old. It's got 15 days to go in the life cycle. You need to be thinking about counting backwards, 60, 59, 58, 57, and so on. So life cycle management starts with the trade walk, creates a sense of urgency, intensity goes way up when you use this, this uh, process. Aging occurs on what day? You tell me, come on, you know, day one. That's right, not day 61. It's a very simple discipline. This is not rocket science. It's not that hard. It does take discipline, though. What will life cycle manage, act, ma management actually do for you? It's going to control your destiny. You're going to get a faster overall turn. Your volume's going to go up. You're going to do more volume. It reduces wholesale losses. Because you're getting on top of these things sooner rather than later. Your worst wholesale losses occur late in the cycle, not early in the cycle. Gross profit actually goes up. Your average gross is going to go up, no doubt. So I've got a few simple questions for you here. I'm going to ask kind of a recap. So ask yourself these questions. Are you managing or leading? Are you so focused on managing stuff that you're not really leading as well as you could? Think about that. What are you a champion of? Are there some things in your organization that you're an absolute champion of? You might want to identify those and make sure you stay on top of them. Can you unlock the legacy thinking that's holding you back? We're really hung up on the way we used to do it. This world is changing and changing fast. You've got to get out in front of it. You can't keep relying on the old way of doing this business. How much of your market are you missing? The used car market's really, really big. 
You wouldn't have to increase your numbers that much more. You should be always trying to get more than your fair share, not your fair share. What's the value of speed? I read a book not long ago, and the book was titled, It's Not the Big That Will Eat the, eat the Small, It's the Fast That Will Eat the Slow. Speed is critical. If you're not getting your stuff through your service department really, really fast, it's killing you. It's hurting your average gross profit. Should you start tracking return on investment in 3030, ROI in 3030? It might be a good drill for you. I promise you this. You get your team to start tracking those two things, those two things, the eyeballs are really going to light up about how critical speed is to make money. What's the benefit of giving your average cost down? What's the benefit of pressing the cost down? It's a simple thing to do. It's not rocket science, no doubt. And how much better off would you be if you attacked the 10 most expensive units in your inventory? Look, think about this. If you did that, if you attacked the 10 most expensive units every day, what would it do to your average cost per use current stock? You'd be getting rid of those more expensive cars. It would help that number a lot. Can you make life cycle management work for you? The last thing I just talked about was life cycle management. Can you make it work for you? Hey, thanks for taking time to watch this video. I'm Tommy Gibbs. I'm most appreciative.